you know the story that talks about um, Moses being up on the hill watching the battle and he has Aaron and her helping him. Well, today Pastor is going to have some things to say, but he's got a whole bunch of us up here helping him. So we're the, we're the helpers today. Today's Sabbath Church is actually a, a panel discussion where we're talking about some of the evidence that exists for creation and for the flood. And a couple things I wanted to mention ahead of time before we get started into it, but one of them is the, the fact that it's neat that we've got so much information, even information that we didn't have when I was a kid, to give us confidence in God's Word. When God says that he created, there's a lot of really good evidence to back that up. When God says that there was a flood, there's a lot of good evidence to back that up. And I don't want to approach it from the idea of let's bash the opponents, people who claim that God didn't do it, but to be able to provide good positive reasons why we can have confidence that God did do these things. And Pastor's going to finish up when we're done here with some of the reasons why it's so important that we can have confidence in that. The other thing I was mentioned too is the fact that you know as well as I do that God doesn't force us to believe him. And I think the idea of evolution versus creation is one of those examples. He could give us enough information that we would be forced to accept it. But I think so often God gives us other alternatives if we really don't want to believe in him or believe what he has written in the Bible for us, that kind of thing, that if we, if we really choose to do something else, he will allow us to do that, as sad as it may be. But anyway, the format we're going to use this morning is that we've got some subjects that we want to share with you. Uh, see me afterward if you want to, or actually I can give you the, a lot of these are things that we've picked up from um, a project called the John 1010 Project, and you can get a lot of that on YouTube and look them up. There are a lot of them that are nice little short um, pieces that talk about some of this evidence. Another one is uh, you've seen some of the DVDs that we've shown in Sabbath school that are from... A DVD set called Is Genesis History? Question mark. And that's, you know, it's not a myth. It really is history. So that's where a lot of it comes from if you want to get more, because there's way more stuff than we can cover in the time we have today. But I'm going to ask uh, Bonnie Edgerly if she'll start out, describe something, and then if any of our panel members want to add to that, uh, then we'll go through a number of different subjects here. Okay, I just, I want to start out with saying, can something be created from nothing? As far as we know, there's nothing that can be created with nothing, unless you're God. God says he did, <laughs> and I believe it. Psalms 139.14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows well, as my soul knows well. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was the complexity of the eye. You know, when you really get in and start looking at how the eye works, it's absolutely amazing. It's got um, you've got rods and you've got cones. Your rods work at night. Your cones work in the daytime. There are over a hundred million cones, or rods, sorry, over a hundred million rods in your eyes that help you to see at night. Um, there's six million cones that are, and these are all packed in the back of your eye. 
one of the amazing things is, and how does this work? They have, they have examined the eye, and when your fovea in the back of your eye sees an object, you actually see it upside down until it hits the brain stem and goes to your brain, at which time it's turned right side up. You know, how does, how does something that complex just uh, evolve? I don't know. It, it baffles my mind. And we have a different eyeball, different workings than animals have. Their eyes are not the same as ours. There's a fish that actually has eight eyes that work different underwater as it does on top of water. We don't have eyes like that, but the fish does. Who else could do that but God? Charles Darwin said, To suppose the eye with all its contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances for admitting different amounts of light and correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. And that's from Charles Darwin. The other thing, now I don't know if you want me to stop yeah, so we can discuss. Go ahead and do that next the, one. Too. Okay. The other thing that just absolutely amazes me, and this always, <laughs> I've, I've been in several surgeries where we've had C-sections. It has never not brought a lump to my throat when I saw the birth of a brand new baby. How a man takes a man takes a woman, you cannot create a child without a man and a woman. It takes a seed, it takes a sperm, it comes together and it, a baby is created. That is a higher design than anything we could make. When I stop and think about a baby, Because I'm a mother, I believe God gave us children so that we could understand his love for us. Anybody want to add to that, Bonnie? I know you've got some comments on that one. Well, I used to work in surgery also, and a friend of mine was an ophthalmologist, and I used to assist him in his um, surgeries and opening the eye and he once told me, he said, you know, all these years, my entire life, I've been studying the eye, and I think I shall never, ever learn everything about the eye. <clears throat> um, it's complex. Um, everything is. So when that baby is born, there are so many things going on in that child that can't just happen. Right. And... Um, so more on these things later. I I enjoyed the C sections also. Yeah. <laughs> you know what we're talking about here is uh, the principle of irreducible complexity, which a lot of scientists who are not Christians have admitted that there are systems and organs, even at the molecular level, that cannot exist if all the parts are not there at once. Exactly. So you can't uh, through evolution, which is materialistic, meaning no intelligent direction. It's all done through what you see randomly. Things like that cannot form and sustain and, and progress because they have to be there at once. All the parts have to be together. What Bonnie said about birth, think about male and female have to evolve at the same time so they're compatible throughout millions of years. The eyeball, one, another example, they're molecular motors that I found with in single-celled organisms that that if you take one part, it doesn't work. So evolution cannot explain how these things evolved. And, you know, going back to what Ralph said, we're, we're not here to bash evolutionists, but I've always wanted to understand how the world came about. And I was brought up in secular universities and secular high schools, so it, evolution never made sense to me. 
because it relies on non-living matter converting to life over millions of years. But both Pasteur and uh, a biologist named Francesco Rady tested and proved that non-living matter cannot generate life. It's called abiogenesis. Mm -hmm. That has been disproven, and evolution relies on that as its foundation. So in my opinion, from my perspective, evolution has been disproved at the very beginning. So we can't even start because abiogenesis has been proven to be wrong. So life cannot come from non-living matter. Rod, can you add some stuff there? Well, I just want to make an observation. Uh, many of us know that Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos Islands looking for evidence of evolution that the theory was already existing at that time. But about 10 years before he was there in the 1820s, another scientist visited Galapagos Islands, and that was David Douglas. And of course, David Douglas was a botanist, but he also studied animals. Um, and he visited much of Canada, uh, the Northwest, Washington, Oregon, California, and actually ended up in Hawaii. So he visited probably a lot more ecosystems than J Darwin did. He actually carried a Bible with him wherever he went, and that was kind of unusual because it was just him and his horse, and he had to carry all of his samples of plants that he was collecting. Never in any of his writings does he refer to the theory of evolution existing. His, from his viewpoint, it was created by God. Thank you. And of course, David Douglas, was, they named the Douglas fir tree after oh, him. Interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that one? Can you pass a mic down to Dindy? Okay. You know, I've always been interested in dinosaurs. And I like going to the museums and watching the videos. And one time, me and my family, we went to Arizona to dinosaur tracks. And there on the ground, you know, is T-Rex you know, feet and other dinosaurs running around like crazy, right? Because, you know, they were trying to run away from the flood. But, of course, you know, they say that was millions of years ago. I, I don't know how that could stay like, like it is, the dinosaur tracks, for millions of years. But they're there, and they're fascinating. So, you know, dinosaurs, um, you know, they've been looking for the fossils for many years now, many decades, you know, over a century. And nobody ever uh, realized to actually take a piece of the bone and go under a microscope and, you know, remove the fossilization and everything and, and just to, to analyze it. No one ever thought of that because they're supposed to be millions of years old. They're, they know, the paleontologists know that there's no way that there's going to be any unfossilized remains. But in the 90s, there was this uh, young paleontologist. Her name was Mary Schweitzer. Okay? And she started doing this. She started you know, analyzing the uh, microscopic um, parts of the fossilized you know, bones of dinosaurs and all that. And she really didn't know what she was seeing, you know, what she was looking at. But it wasn't until the two, in, t in 2000, she was working with a paleontologist, Jack Horner, who was a famous uh, paleontologist at the time. And there was this, uh, they were, I think, in Hell Creek in Montana, uh, where there's you know, beds of uh, dinosaur bones. And there was this huge T-Rex femur bone, right? I mean, huge. And it weighed over 2,000 pounds. And they just, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't move it all in one piece. So they had to break it, right? So they broke it in half. And Mary, you know, she went there and she, when they broke it, she went there and got some of the, you know, some of that fossilized bone. She took it to her lab and she started analyzing it. And lo and behold, you know, she saw red blood cells. You know, she removed the, the, all the fossilized and the calcium and all that. She saw connective tissue, red blood cells, um, uh, bone cells flexible and brown and, and branching blood vessels, right? Elastic and all that. And of course, you know, she told everyone, hey, look, you know, look what I'm finding, unfossilized dinosaur remains. And of course, all her paleontologists said, no way, that's impossible, that cannot happen, you know. 
Um, yeah, they were saying, well, oh, it got contaminated, whatever, you know. But, you know, how are you going to get blood vessels and bone, uh, you know, cal uh, calcium in there and all this? So anyway, so other paleontologists have started to look at this also, right? And, and this is from the 2000s. And, and there's been like 85 reports of, of other paleontologists also looking at these bone tissues and everything. And they're finding the same thing. You know, all this elastic proteins and, and red blood cells and everything. And they, they made papers on it and all that. And of course, they're very perplexed. You know, they've done studies on decay and there's like no way you could, you know, maybe 100,000 years, you know, but not for, yeah, not for, uh, you know, the T-Rex is like 65 million years. They are like, like, no way that can't happen. And they're, so they're coming up with all these kinds of uh, theories on, you know, what it could be, you know, and they think that their, their concept of decay, they don't understand, right? They're thinking that maybe things take longer to decay, than, you know, but they're <laughs> never going to come to the conclusion where it's, it's just thousands of years old, right? And, uh, and, and not only are they finding it in dinosaur, um, you know, bones or fossilized, dinosaur stuff, but also anything that's buried, anything that's fossilized, any animal, even human. You know, you know that guy, um, Iceman? Have you heard of him? In Europe somewhere, they, you know, he's buried in the snow. You know, even they cut him up and they looked at his tissue and everything. It looks the same. I mean, they, you know, the blood vessels, the red blood cells and everything. It looks the same as the dinosaurs. It's like in the same condition. And they say that it's at least... His is at least 5,000 years old, right? But they all look the same, same condition. And even, you know, there's uh, geological columns, you know, the Jurassic, Triassic, all that, all the way down. There's like 10 major ones, right? And the last one is the uh, pre-Columbian, right? And this, that level is like a half a billion years old, okay? Half a billion years old. And they've even found some unfossilized remains in the same condition as the ones at 65 million or 5,000, half a billion, same condition, you know. So, and of course, you know, there, you, you don't hear this in the mainstream news or anything, right? Because they don't want you to know. I mean, you really have to, uh, you know, go deep into that. But if you look up Mary Schweitzer, you'll find out her information there and how she started. And it's interesting to note that she says she's a Christian, right? That she's a Christian and that these creationists are twisting her information around, you know. But, but she says that she separates, you know, her work as an evolutionist and Christianity, right? And she says, well, Christianity, you just need faith, you know. But this is science, you know. This is science and, and you know, this is... Of course, they, they can't even explain their science, what they're doing, you know. They just come up with these crazy, um, you know, theories. But, um, but you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, you know, because as an evolutionist, as a paleontologist, if, if you're a Christian and you believe in Christianity principles, they will ostracize you, right? They'll kick you out. And I don't know, maybe she's a secret Christian and, and she's coming up with all this stuff, you know. Uh, she's saying we're twisting it, but... Uh, maybe she's just giving us the, you know, information to, to prove that they're only thousands of years old, and not millions. Okay. Thanks, Thank Mindy. Um, I can remember when I was in academy, and we were studying about the cell and different things like that, and uh, quite a few of you here are my age or or even go farther back. It's amazing how much has changed about our understanding of the cell since then. And I can remember, you know, basically you had the nucleus of the cell and then around that was what they called protoplasm. And at least the way I understood it, it was, you know, kind of like jello. And I think that if the devil had tried to introduce the idea of evolution much later, once we knew so much more about the cell, it would have been a whole lot harder to sell the idea. But Bonnie's had something I've heard her mention a few times, and I haven't heard it very many other places, and I'm going to ask if she'll mention what that one is. 
Well, it's just my logic, and it's already kind of come up. But if you have, I should start by saying I looked up some of the evolutionary proposals on how life started. And there's a lot of long names and words that we've never heard of, and I don't plan to ever hear of them again because I can't pronounce them. <laughs> Uh, but <clears throat> so they've made a whole science out of this. But basically, the cell, uh, the the whatever the thing is that that they proposed started life or crawled around or whatever or swam, and they they're thinking things on on land became swimming animals. Um, but the thing is, when life started. <clears throat> In evolution, they don't take stock of the fact that you have to have a way to um, circulate whatever was in that first thing they think of. You have to have a way to reproduce. Mm -hmm. You have to have a way to nourish and use that nourishment. Um, there's, there's so many systems that we know of and we have and <clears throat> that babies are born with uh, it's just not logical that anything could go a million years till the next part of it happened or or another 3 million years or 20 million years till the next part of it happened. So um, I just logic it out that way in my own mind. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> had I ever been introduced to evolution in my younger life, I think I would have had a problem because of that. And then when you mentioned uh, the dinosaurs and the tracks and everything, it triggered my memory that um, I was on a trip down in, I can't even remember which state because it's near where all five, four states come together. Um, but we were going down to uh, boating to Rainbow, uh, I, I don't know if they called it bridge, but it's one of the arches. Rainbow Arch, and as we were walking to it from the boat, uh, there were there were dinosaur tracks in the rock, in the hard rock. And as a kid, I was kind of taught that well, there weren't dinosaurs. That's just a story, but we know there were, <laughs> and a lot of things in the '40s and '50s that, if you didn't ever understand it, it didn't occur. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to see dino dinosaur tracks was pretty interesting to me. Anyway, that's kind of what I, what I wanted to get to, that uh, you need all these parts in order to make a... Uh, evolution just doesn't work. That's it. <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah. What Dendi mentioned about the scientist, who's she's a Christian, but she's also an evolutionist. Yeah. Um, you know, true science is just looking at the evidence and then following the evidence to where it leads you. That's, that's science. That's how we reasonably look at the world. But in college, when I went to college, and it's the, in the academic field, in the secular academic professions, God is not allowed to be a possible explanation. It, they, they don't want a divine foot in the door is what they say. And that reminds me of uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 28, where Paul writes, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So people have chosen to reject God, not because there's no evidence for him. They don't want God in their lives. And going back to the cell, um, you know, you kind of assume, oh, the cell started and it evolved over time. But my question is, how did the components of the cell <laughs> form at the beginning? And I, back, at, back in 1999, I, I have an article from the Institute for Creation Research in which this, the writer analyzes statistically what it would take to create even the molecules that com compose the cell. And the conclusion is, it's one in... 10 to the 4 millionth power. So 1 over 1 with 4 million zeros chance of doing that. But 
the total number of particles in the universe is one, in, it's 10 to the 80th. So it's like 4 million times less likely. I mean, it's not even, it's, it's basically so Im remote it's impossible. There aren't enough molecules, enough particles in the universe to randomly come together to even create the components inside the cell. So at that level, evolution is, is, has been debunked. It's not, I mean, it's a, it was a theory that worked back when people didn't know what was happening in the cell. They didn't know about genetics. They didn't know a lot of what we know now. So it worked back then when the cell was very simple, just a ball of jelly. And you can imagine how it would magically over time <clears throat> like grow and develop. But now we know what it takes. And based on our knowledge, evolution just doesn't work. So people continue to promote it because they don't want God in their life. And it comes down to a kind of a spiritual re rebellion against God. I think what's sad with that too is that there are so many people who've been trained since they were just kids that this, you know, just like we believe the earth is round, they've been taught the same way that evolution is the way it all came together. Oh, yeah. And so I think in a lot of ways it's, there are some people that I think maliciously promote this, but so many others who just, they've never known anything different. Right. And, and they're intimidated by scientific terminology like so, you know if, if you're not trained in the sciences the terminology can become very intimidating yeah and then and then we quiet down because we can't we don't have an answer but you know i i, I have a scientific background so i i understand the arguments are not plausible so but you know if i if i bring this up with my professors they would hear none of it because it's they were taught that way and it's simply unquestionable it is the dogma of the scientific mindset but the real science is just where does the evidence lead you and i think there's a lot of evidence for creation i mean think about what we have in each of our cells the chromosomes have encoded like messages like there's code there's actually intelligent mechanisms by which we reproduce and and, and our cells grow that code cannot be m random. It's, it's like a language, and language comes from an intelligence. It's, you can't randomly generate a computer program. It, it's an intelligent, directed process started by a thinking entity, being God. When, when you look at some of the... Uh, a computer... For instance, who who made the computer? It didn't just fall together. You know, it there's there's pieces that have to go specifically where they go for a body to just randomly grow or come together. It makes about as much sense as sitting around and waiting for an iPhone to appear on my desk, you know, it it just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, our brains weigh about three pounds and they're mostly fat. But they are <laughs> so much more advanced than any computer program, any computer system that anyone's ever designed. A, a person can design something not nearly as advanced as what we have in our heads. I, I mean, let's just ask the honest questions. It, it, there's, there's, and I think Ben and I were talking earlier. Most scientists have come to the conclusion that there is intelligent design, but I think the the theory of evolution persists because it's in the culture and it takes time for for these old myths to be kind of fleshed out. And I think having discussions like this helps give us confidence when we examine the evidence that we don't have to go with the the narrative that's pushed in the educational system. We have to look at the facts and the evidence, which the scientists already know there's intelligence. Maybe not Dawkins, but someone else. Well, Dawkins, um, Richard Dawkins, you know, um, there's always a top evolutionist all the time, like the Pope, you know. And Richard Dawkins is, is one of the top ones, right? I think he's, I think he's still alive. But anyway, he was asked you know, about the DNA, you know, it's so sophisticated and, you know, it's programmed and everything. 
And what, are, what were his thoughts on the DNA? And you know what he said? He goes, well, he goes, maybe in the long time ago in the past, there was an intelligent um, beings that came here and seeded the earth with the, you know, with the DNA. That's what, that was his answer, right? And of course, the person asking him the answer was like, well, you know, what, a, what about God? You know, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, you know, the, you know, he's the one that created, you know, but they won't believe in God, you know, but they do believe that there was possibly a higher intelligence that came here millions of years ago, though, and seeded the planet. My question would be, where did the aliens come from? I mean, yeah. you're just you're just wasting, you're just kicking the can down the road. Eventually, you have to get to the beginning, and where is that beginning? One of the uh, main things about uh, evolution is uh, long periods of erosion and deposition. You know, you look at the Grand Canyon and you see all these layers. Well, there's a place in Walla Wall, outside of Walla Wall, called the Little Grand Canyon. And there are specific layers. It looks just like the Grand Canyon. And uh, that happened overnight. It was a break in an irrigation pipe. <laughs> and it eroded this canyon that's, I think it's over 100 feet deep. And yet it formed overnight. And it looks... There are discrete layers. Well, look what happened on May 18th, 1980. Right. You know, you look at uh, the erosion <laughs> and a deposition that occurred in a very, very short time at Mount St. Helens. And, and if you look at the Grand Canyon as you, as you look at the layers at the Mount St. Helens, you see that there are specific layers. There's no transition between layers where there's been erosion and then a layer, yeah. erosion and a layer. They're just straight across. What I think is real interesting with that too, Paul, is I was listening, re refreshing my memory on one of them this morning, and they talk about the, the Grand Canyon and those layers in there. And within the Grand Canyon, um, First of all, I think just the fact that God opened that area up so we could see. I mean, it would be hard for us to, to dig down 4,000 feet in order to be able to see some of these layers. But in addition to the 4,000 feet within uh, Grand Canyon, right around that, there are additional layers that go up an additional 10,000 feet. So we're talking 14,000 feet of sedimentary layers and when they look at these layers a lot of these layers you can see that that particular deposition exists over almost the whole the United States and then from another direction there'll be another whole deposition on top of that one and I was listening this morning and they said there are like 17 of these different layers and some of them just huge and so I think when we look at whether or not there was something like the flood, uh, there's so much evidence that you, it's hard to find any other way to explain how all of that could have happened. And then like Paul said, you know, if you, if you put down a nice smooth layer and then wait a million years before you put a layer over it, <laughs> to think that that layer isn't going to have any erosion or anything, uh, and yet what you see between layers are nice clean lines between the layers. Oh, one of them along that line too, and I think Bonnie and I saw it when we were at Yellowstone. They've got a petrified tree that's standing up and you can actually see that it goes through a number of layers of, of the uh, um, sediment. And again, if there were long periods of time between layers, the tree's not going to maintain itself long enough for you to get a wait a long time and then put another layer on it. And what's even more is that when they check into that a little bit, those trees don't have roots, mm -hmm. which agrees with what we saw at, at uh, Spirit Lake mm -hmm. with Mount St. Helens, where uh, they have trees that have been knocked down during the, the volcanic explosion 
were floating for years in Spirit Lake with no roots or anything on them because those have all either been knocked off or when they were blown down, they weren't there. And then eventually those trees sink root ball first mm. yep. and then get buried in the sediment. So there's a, a, we've found, even with things like Mount St. Helens, they've given us clues to how a tree could exist in a sedimentary area going through many layers of sediment, but not over millions and millions of years. Any other things? Oh, oh. no, I just... Go ahead. I thought he was going to pass the oh. microphone. Okay. I, 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 going off with what, uh, what uh, Ralph said, um, there's something called the Great Unconformity, which is a, a rock layer that stretches across every continent on Earth. And that baffles geologists because they don't know how that could have happened but it, it goes right in line with the 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 flood, which which uh, used water deposition to create this layer upon which other layers were then deposited by water. Because the angle of the layers is is consistent with how water deposits soil and sediment versus like other non-water driven uh, depositions. And Mount St. Helens is a great example of how catastrophism can create what geological formations we see in the world, canyons and rivers and, and just things just being created quickly, which is what the flood was. The flood was basically a, a global wide, worldwide uh, catastrophic event that completely jumbled the, the Earth's surface. And we see microcosms of that with both Mount St. Helens and other places where you see like local catastrophes that just dig and create the same formations that we see with Grand Canyon, for example. Another area that I wanted to bring up is uh, the butterfly. When you think of an evolutionary process where you've got something that, that slowly evolves from one thing to another, it would be a real challenge for that kind of a process to create a butterfly. And I'll open it up for some the, the panel to comment on it, but the basic thing I'm thinking of there is you have something that's first of all an egg so this little critter exists in that environment, in that structure. Then it comes out of the egg and goes into a second structure as a caterpillar. But probably the most impressive is when it goes then from being a caterpillar, as it was described in one of these videos, is it basically hangs up down, upside down and dies yep. for all practical purposes. And then this little sack of material gets transformed mm -hmm. into something totally different. They described it like if you had a Model T running down the road and the Model T stops and the hood on the Model T comes off and it grows to be something big enough to completely encase the Model T. Uh -huh. And then you hear all that kind of noises going on inside. <laughs> and a few weeks later, the doors open up on this little Bugatti. Quonset hut and out flies, flies a helicopter. <laughs> That's right. And yet what happens with a butterfly is so much more beyond that. And the whole idea of having, you know, yeah. when a baby is, is formed, at no point is it anything other than a baby becoming a human. Mm -hmm. But to have something that I think God did on purpose, to yeah. say, if you really think it evolved, mm -hmm. try this one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so any, anything anybody wants to add to that? Well, yeah, it's, uh, during the metaphor metamorphosis, the, the body of the caterpillar is liquefied. It, yeah. It's like becomes jelly, and you're thinking, how will this be ever reconstituted into something that's actually living again? It's like, I mean, the, the programming required for that is amazing, and that's where you know, the DNA, the genes come in. It's, it's just one of the many miracles. Like when a baby is born, the baby has to transition from a water environment to an air environment with li within like what minutes? I don't. I mean, it's it's a short amount of time. Seconds. Seconds, and the circulation has to change too. It's. I don't know when when I when I think of these things, the more we learn about the details of nature. I, look, it, I, evolution to me is just it's it's just magic. <laughs> You think about a heart just sitting there and pumping. What's it going to pump? Yeah. It has to pump blood. 
where's it's going to get the where's it going to get the blood from? It has to be oxygenated. It has to go through the lungs. You know, it it has to go through all of these systems in order to feed what it needs to feed. And none of that is going to work without your brain stem. You got to have a brain in order for your heart to pump, in order for the blood to flow. And not only is it blood, but what have you got in your blood? You've got red blood cells. You've got white blood cells. You've got plasma. You, your platelets. You know, you need absolutely every single one of those things. If you get cut, you've got a clot. Otherwise, you're going to bleed to death, you know. But if you clot too much... You're gonna you're 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 gonna die of a stroke before you even get started, you know. It's just it's amazing to me, the complexity of a human body, that you need every single component in your body. There's nothing in your body. I mean, you can cut limbs off and stuff, but your organs, every single one of your organs, is absolutely required for human existence. Um, in a pharmacological class during nurses' training, the, f the pharmacy professor had, uh, there was a blackboard that went completely across the front of the room. And it's a, it's a university college classroom, so you know that's a very big blackboard. And he started writing over here, and he wrote <laughs> the chemical... A formula for clotting, the clotting mechanism, and it goes completely clear across the room. And I can't tell you, <laughs> there's no way I could ever reproduce that one, but uh, it's just complex. And your heart, it yeah. requires a sodium potassium yeah. pump yeah. in order for it, for yeah. the electrical part of your heart to work. Yes. Can I give a little plug on Sabbath school? We like to, we like to infuse ourselves with some information and so that it's you know if you have the occasion to talk to someone about these things you've got some really good solid background and <clears throat> quite often in uh, some of you have seen some of these uh, things from John 1010 and other uh, other avenues that we show in Sabbath school from time to time from 930 to 945 so uh, I plan to show some over again that I consider complex enough that you'll pick up something new even if you've seen it. Um, one of them will be on the little motors in the cell. Uh, the, and Yes, and um, anyway, we're just going to show some over again that really help, uh, help us in our thinking and in our uh, ability to reproduce information. I've got one more comment, and then I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Dan. But the uh, what's been alluded to... What's that? Oh, okay. Good enough. Let me do one quickly in here, and then we'll let... Uh, I. When you look at... If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to find one of the videos that shows an animation of what goes on inside the cell. Yeah. Or and it, school. it yeah. It literally is a factory with all kinds of little machines running in there. Um, being a mechanical engineer and I know I'm not the only engineer here or if you count the mechanics and all the rest of us is they have found in some of these very simple uh, one-celled animals where they've got and a, a literal electric motor with the kind of components that you would find in a motor that makes the little tail spin. And so it's just, it's, it's fun, if nothing else, to see some of these things that God has made. So Peter, then I'll pass it on to Pastor Dan. I, oh. I, just, I just want to say that uh, in, in my biology books, you know, going through high school and stuff, they talked about a simple cell. And yeah. there is no such thing as a simple cell because if you can, if it has to take in oxygen, release carbon dioxide, if it has to move, if it has to reproduce, all these things in a single cell, 
That's not simple, folks. Right. None of these things were known when we were going to school, some of us. Yeah. If, if, <laughs> you know, if, if it's so simple, why can't they make one? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we're talking about the fine-tuning of our bodies. There's also fine-tuning in, in the, the universe and just in the, our solar system. It's called the anthropic principle. If you Google it, 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 it they've, they've gone into like deep into even like the subatomic forces involved that if they're slightly off you wouldn't be able to survive like we wouldn't be there would be no life on earth if the if the earth is slightly closer or slightly farther from the sun we'd either freeze or burn um the gravitational constant is it, it's such a such a precise setting that if it's deviated just a little bit you would have nothing so you know stuff like that these are just clues about how god is the creator. I mean, there's other other clues. The seven-day week is one which I always like to think about. That came out of nowhere. It's like there's no there's no natural phenomenon that would govern a seven-day week. That's that's straight up God put a clue there. Just think about it. As I've been sitting here listening and I've been looking out it might seem like we're preaching to the choir. One of the advantages that we have living where we are is I think most of us believe in creation. But if you go outside of our little community, even with within Adventism, there are more and more people who do not. And it's kind of shocking to me the fact that it's kind of a contradiction. I mean, how can you be an Adventist and not believe in the creation story? Um, when I was a student at seminary, there was a uh, Sabbath afternoon activity. It was not not through Andrews. It was hosted at the campus, but it was not associated with the university. But uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Irv Taylor. I don't know if any of you recognize the name. But anyway, Adventist today. I don't know if any of you read it. Anyway, Irv Taylor came and uh, claims to claim he's uh, since died, but he claimed to be an Adventist. But he believed in theist. I can't say it. Yes. Where he believed in God, but he believes that creation took place over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And when you think about when you think about that and how it contradicts what scripture says about seven twenty four hour days, literal days, um, it really undermines everything that we believe. When you look at, you know, as Adventists, we tend to be last, I, and I've said this before, we tend to be last day event junkies, right? And you think about the three angels' messages, right? We always talk about the three angels' messages. Well, you look at the first angel's message, what does it say? Fear God, for the hour of his judgment has come. But then it says, worship him who made the heavens and the earth, Right? We worship God because he is our creator. And if you go back to the book of Gen you know, we can, we can have prayer meeting about the book of Revelation and our attendance goes up. We have prayer meeting where we talk about Genesis, which we're currently doing. What happens to attendance at prayer meetings? Goes down, right? But you think about how important what the book of Genesis talks about. You look at just the first couple chapters of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Is that relevant to the time in which we're living today? And then... In uh, chapter 2, verse 2, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because, he had, because on it he rested 
from all the work of creating he had done. When you take away the first couple chapters of Genesis and you say it's all fiction, it's not real, you're undermining everything. You're undermining you know, the fact of gender, you know, male and female. A lot of times when we're talking to people about the Sabbath, what do they say? Well, that's a Jewish thing, right? No, it's not. You know, it started from the very beginning, even before the first Jew even came on the scene. Um, so, I mean, it really undermines everything that we believe. But uh, earlier, Dendi was talking about the uh, geologic column, right? You take the section of the earth and you take all the layers and they say, well, you look at that and you have, you have animals, you know, you have the dinosaurs and you have all that and you have that at the bottom and then you go up in that column and then you have man. So they, what they're saying by looking at that, they're saying that death occurred millions of years before man ever came on the scene. If you believe that, if you believe that death existed way before man ever came on the scene, then you're totally getting rid of the idea of original sin. And if you get rid of original sin, then you're getting rid of the Savior. There's no need for Jesus to come. There's no need for Jesus to die if sin did not cause death. So when you're getting rid of creation, you're getting rid of every single thing. It, it just falls apart. Um, so believing in creation is so important. And like uh, Peter was saying earlier when he was referring Romans chapter 1, it's the fact that God has allowed humanity to make a choice. Do we have the faith in God? Do we believe in what the Bible says? Or does he give the freedom of choice to say, you know what? Even all the evidence is here. I'm going to choose otherwise. And you think about when Jesus was on earth performing all the miracles. And what did they say? What are you going to do that we can believe? You know, <laughs> what else are you going to do? And Jesus had performed sign after sign after sign. So it is a choice. It is a willing choice that people are making to say, you know what, I don't want to believe in God because I do not want to believe that there's a higher power that has the right to control and to dictate to me what I'm going to do with my life. So the question is, you know, do we want to get rid of God? Or do we want to say, you know what, I choose to believe that there's a higher power that loves me enough, who created me, who formed me, but also loves me enough that he was willing to send himself down on this earth to die to pay the price so that I could have eternal life. To me, that is a far better option than believing that we came out of some slime or some Big Bang explosion or, you know, all of that stuff. I would like to believe, I do, I, said, I should say, I choose to believe that there is a God who loves me infinitely more than I can possibly imagine. You know, uh, we have a lot of evidence that supports our faith. Uh, but for someone who decides not to accept God, there's not enough evidence to convince them. I have a friend who, who told me, I'll believe in God if he appears right in front of me and does a miracle. And, and I'm thinking, if that happens, he'll probably say, well, this was an illusion or a hallucination. Right. I think the evidence is, is plentiful for our faith to be supported. Mm -hmm. That's right. And become, it comes down to like, almost like a spiritual conflict here between <coughs> Satan, who tries to deceive, and Jesus, who tries to save. And it, the decision is up to us. But we, we don't have to be afraid of the scientific jargon or authorities or their 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 degrees because there's enough evidence plenty of evidence to sustain our faith it's reasonable peter said we haven't believed fables we've we were eyewitnesses and we see we witness god's work around us i 
think we could have a lot of fun going on quite a ways yet, but I'm going to ask Pastor if you'll go ahead and, and wrap up with the benediction. And we can always continue after lunch. Sure. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's uh, stand for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we stand here in this beautiful location where all we have to do is just open our eyes and to see the evidence of your powerful, creative work. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with us as we continue to worship you as our not only our Savior, but also our Creator. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with us as we continue to Thank you for everything that you have done. And Father, I also want to thank you for the food that you have provided, because of strength and nourishment as we continue to serve you today. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.